I put my RTX 3080 graphics card inside the Cooler Master Q500L, a PC case which is notorious for poor thermals, and not because it's small, but because of some very poor design choices. So how did the RTX 3080 perform, what impact did it have on the rest of the components, and is there anything we can do to make this setup perform acceptably? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. For this video, we're going to be doing something interesting and I've been wanting to do this for quite some time. If you've been following my channel for a while now, then you'll know that one of the main reasons why I wanted an RTX 3080 so badly when it was released was because this seemed like the perfect card to pair with my LG C9 4K OLED TV. Prior to that, I was using my RTX 2080 Super, and while that card still today is a fantastic GPU, it did fall short when it came to 4K performance, and the lack of HDMI 2.1 meant that I couldn't enjoy 4K 120Hz. The RTX 3080 works great. It's got HDMI 2.1 for 4K 120Hz with a G-Sync support. It also has a lot of power to push fairly high frame rates, even in modern titles at this resolution. Though, while the 3080 is an impressively fast GPU, it also is known for being quite power hungry and therefore running fairly warm. Now that HTPC I built was using a Cooler Master Q500L, and this case is infamous for having poor thermals. Various other tech reviewers and sites pretty much all came to the same conclusion, and I did experience its drawbacks for myself as my Ryzen 5 3600 was running quite hot with the more beefier Wraith Prism cooler. So I had to use a 120mm AIO to help keep temps in check, and even then I'd say they were a tad bit higher than where I'd like them to be. One of the main reasons why I still decided to use this case was because, for me, its biggest selling point was how I could repurpose my older full-size X370 ATX motherboard in this small form factor case. I didn't have to purchase a separate ITX MOBO, which usually have a premium cost, and so do ITX cases. For its inside layout, it really does have an interesting and unique layout that I haven't seen other manufacturers use. Cooler Master did think outside the box with this one, and I was happy to see that. And the fact that it only cost me about 50 bucks Canadian, it seemed like a pretty decent deal and I thought I could put up with the poor thermals as a trade-off. But speaking of thermals, I don't know what they were thinking when it came to ensuring the user could configure the case for optimal airflow. I mean sure, it's got plenty of fan mounts, I've got two 120mm fans installed on the bottom, one 120 and one 140mm fan at the top, and one 120mm AIO radiator mounted on the rear in a push-pull configuration. By the way, those top mounted fans are set up as intakes as there are no front intake fans since that's where the PSU mounts and a long card like the RTX 3080 Trio blocks the air from the bottom. So you might be thinking, well, that sounds like a lot of airflow, what's your problem then? Well, even though there's a numerous amount of fans installed, they can only be useful if they'll have unrestricted access to move air. Take a close look at the panels and the placement of the holes. It's not a fine mesh, the holes are too small and there aren't enough of them. This results in the fans mostly getting choked for air and it restricts airflow. So if the fans can't really draw fresh cool air in from the outside, then the rest of the components inside the case will experience high temps and this problem is further ne negatively impacted when you put a GPU like the RTX 3080 inside a case such as this one. Since then you're going to be dealing with a component that's drawing much more power and that extra heat has to go somewhere. If there isn't sufficient airflow to exhaust out all that hot air, things are going to get quite toasty. Simply put, the Cooler Master Q500L just turns into an absolute hotbox, but we'll get into more detail in just a moment. I remember watching GN's video where they took a special drill bit that was used to enlarge the holes, and that did help improve thermals, but then it also destroyed the structural integrity of the panel and it looked horrific, so they didn't recommend it as a mod. Nevertheless, I still wanted to use this case because of its benefits as I mentioned already, such as repurposing my old ATX X370 board in such a small case like this, especially because I'd be using this with my TV and didn't want a giant mid-tower beside it. So to test out the RTX 3080 and its impact on the rest of the components inside the Q500L, what I did was pretty simple and straightforward. I launched up a game, played for about an hour, and logged attempts using a program like Hardware Info. I probably could have gotten better and more accurate results using thermocouples or sensors, but I don't own any of those, so a software monitoring solution was the next best thing. Though it should still give us a pretty good idea on what the thermal behavior is like for the components. I decided to test just two games, Forza Horizon 4 and Shadow of the Tomb Raider, as that should provide us with plenty of data on how the system behaves under a gaming load, which is mainly what I use this system for. 
Before I jump into the results, I just quickly wanted to run down the specs of the system. For the CPU, we've got an AMD Ryzen 7 3800XD, which is cooled by a Thermaltake Water 3.0 120mm AIO. For the RAM, we've got 16GB of G-Skill Trident Z memory. These are two 8GB sticks of Samsung B-Die, which I've manually overclocked to 3600MHz, and tuned the timings. And why I mention that is important later. For the motherboard, we've got a Gigabyte X370 Gaming 5. The GPU we'll be using is the RTX 3080 Gaming X Trio from MSI. For storage, we've got a 1TB Western Digital Black SN750 NVMe SSD. Powering all the components is a Corsair Vengeance 750W 80 Plus Silver PSU. Now that the specs are all out of the way, let's jump into the results. To start off, we'll be taking a look at the results that I attained from Forza Horizon 4. Now, I've been playing this game a lot on my 4K OLED. It looks absolutely stunning, and it's just so fun to drive around the beautiful countrysides of the UK. During my playing session, the RTX 3080 averages around 77 degrees Celsius for the core and peaked at 82 degrees, and as you can see, it warms up fairly quickly and gets above 80 degrees and plateaus off there. Now, while these temps aren't horrible, they're also not great. However, if you have a GPU that runs at around 80 degrees Celsius during your gaming session, it probably wouldn't be too problematic. However, when we take a look at the other thermal sensors from the GPU, we see some concerning stuff. Our GPU hotspot temp on average was around 88 degrees Celsius and peaked at 93, while the memory junction temperatures averaged 97 degrees and peaked at 102. So when we take into account the thermal results of those parts, now it definitely seems like it's running a bit too hot for comfort. I mean, you can see the memory junction creep up to 100 degrees Celsius and hover around there for the duration of the gameplay. And while G6X memory is known to run hot and is fine up to 110 degrees Celsius, I'd ideally like it to have much lower operating temps. I personally haven't experienced anything detrimental to the car's performance running it like this, nor have I experienced any crashes or errors, but it concerns me for its longevity and would much rather prefer lower temps. Now moving on, let's see how the rest of the system is impacted. While playing, we can see the CPU running at around 77 degrees Celsius average and peaked at 95 degrees Celsius, while our memory dims were operating with an average temp of around 55 and peaked at 62. And that is concerning because, as I had mentioned, these are dims with Samsung BDI, which I've overclocked, and they're known to being temperature sensitive, especially above 50 degrees Celsius. But luckily, I haven't encountered any errors with them. Looking at our temperature over time graph lets us see this behavior of the CPU over this duration of gameplay, and you can see the sporadic behavior with many spikes into the mid to high 80s and occasionally going over 90 degrees Celsius. Again, the GPU isn't going to get damaged by running it like this, but it's just that I would ideally like it to run with lower temps due to various other factors like noise and concern for the CPU's overall lifespan. So as you guys can see, the system with the RTX 3080 tends to run quite hot, and this is just about an hour of gameplay. With much longer sessions of gameplay, the temps would have been slightly higher and the system can get kind of loud and this is more of an issue in this scenario since I'm not playing with headphones so I can't really drown out all that excess noise. However, there is one way to help alleviate this problem and it's a simple solution. We will have to undervolt our RTX 3080. Now I've made a couple videos in the past covering undervolting the RTX 3080, 3060 Ti and even the 3090. And if you're interested in seeing a more in-depth video covering the topic and also some gaming benchmarks to see how performance was impacted, then I highly urge you to check those videos out. Link for them will be in the description. Now I've shown that undervolting the RTX 30 series Ampere GPUs is pretty much the way to go. You get much lower power usage which therefore results in considerably less heat and you hardly lose any performance and if you actually fine tune it you can even gain a bit of performance since the GPU has higher thermal headroom. So using the RTX 3080 in the Cooler Master Q500L in this manner was pretty much a no brainer. I immediately realized that in order for me to use this GPU comfortably in this system I'll have to utilize my undervolt. Now for the undervolt settings, I had used MSI Afterburner and targeted 1850MHz, which is close to the advertised boost specification for this card at 850mV. When we compare the GPU core thermals, we see a significant difference in operating temps. We're looking at about a 10 degree drop, which is quite significant for no performance loss. The RTX 3080 when undervolted averaged 67 degrees Celsius and peaked at just 73, and we see the same behavior there as well. The GPU hotspot temps have been brought down to the low to mid 80s, whereas before they were in the 90s and our GPU memory junction temps have been brought down to the low 90s, down from the low 100s, so it's a significant improvement. 
When we compare the results to the GPU stock configuration, we can see that across the board, we have 10 degree drops for the averages. While the GPU memory temps are still on the hotter side, at least they're not teetering around that range of temps where I'd be concerned if it was going to damage the RAM, if it'll thermal throttle, or cause any errors. As for how this benefits the rest of the system, we also do see some considerable drops in those components as well. 5 degrees for the CPU and it peaked at 88 degrees, and the memory dims are also dropped to around, you know, 4 to 5 degrees. So, not as profound as what we saw with the GPU, but remember, there is still a decent amount of heat being pumped out from this RTX 3080, it's just not as bad as it was before. Our temperature over time graph lets us see the CPU hovering around in the mid 70s with some spikes into the mid to high 80s, but it never really goes beyond that. Now let's move on to the results from Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I won't be going into too much details and explanations of the results here as you guys should have a pretty good idea on what to expect, but I just wanted to include a different title that was demanding in its own way to see what kind of impacts we'd see here. The results are pretty similar for the GPU, with an average GPU temp of around 80 degrees Celsius, that's actually a bit higher than Forza Horizon, and we can see the average memory junction temp at around 100 degrees Celsius and peaked at 106, so yeah, it's very hot. The other components in the system also experience the same thermal behavior as what we saw in Forza Horizon 4. With our temperature over time graph, we can see the CPU operating in the mid to high 70s, with spikes into the 80s. Now when undervolted, we again see the awesome benefits of running the GPU in this sort of configuration. Now the GPU core temps sit around the high 60s and low 70s. The memory temps have also fallen about 10 degrees, and we're not seeing it go past 100 degrees Celsius, which is definitely a welcome change. Looking at the averages, and we see larger drops from what we saw with Forza Horizon 4. With the GPU core temps dropping 13 degrees, the hotspot temps dropping 12 degrees, and the memory dropping 11 degrees. The rest of the system also enjoys those same benefits of the lower heat from the GPU, and here we can see the CPU operating around 70 degrees Celsius and our memory modules running in the mid 50s. Now if you were wondering how this undervolt had impacted the performance, it hardly did. I've already done some benchmarks in my other videos, but in this scenario we can see that with the GPU running at stock, it was averaging around 1900 MHz for the core, but when we undervolted we get a much more consistent behavior where the GPU is running at 1845 MHz. So there's a difference of around 55 MHz in the operating frequency when under load, and that would at most result in like a 2 or 3 FPS loss, which wouldn't be perceivable at all to the user, and I can attest to this as when I was using the system like this with the undervolt, I did not notice any performance differences, and it was all running just as smoothly as before. In fact, it may have been actually running a little bit better, potentially because the CPU was experiencing lower temps and therefore could allow itself to boost higher too. So there's trade-offs there as well, and honestly, the benefits just outweigh the hot temperatures and, you know, just running the, running the GPU at stock. All in all, undervolting the RTX 3080 really saved me here. We were able to lower our temps considerably, not just for the GPU, but also for the CPU, RAM, and other components as well. While I like the Q500L for its unique design layout, allowing one to utilize a full-size ATX MOBO in such a small case, Cooler Master really dropped the ball when it came to cooling, which is kind of ironic saying that. It's also pretty comical because on their website they even show pictures of this case being filled with large GPUs and coolers, but again, if there's hardly any good airflow coming into the system, what good will all of that even do? So here's hoping that if Cooler Master does make a newer version of this case, they'll utilize a better mesh panel. As for now, I'm content with using the system like this, and I'm enjoying games at 4K on my LG C9 OLED. I hope you guys found this video to be informative and helpful. Let me know your thoughts down below. Check out the video description on ways to support the channel and for my other videos. If you guys are interested in more content like this, then make sure you subscribe. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you guys in the next one.